All right, so let's get started in C programming. So for engineering, we care about a couple of things, right? We want to be able to put in numbers. We want to be able to put in sentences. And we want to be able to get out some numbers and sentences, the same stuff as we got in, but just maybe the numbers are the output from some calculation. The sentence is like if we had a uh, certain condition happen or whatever, then it produces a sentence. So we want the same sorts of inputs as outputs. Um, and then in the middle here, we want a couple things. We want to be able to do math operations. So do some math. Uh, repeated operations as well as make decisions and all of these sort of tie into specific things so this is operators this is loops as well as functions and this is conditionals such as if so that's what we want to be able to do. And with C, we're able to do just that. Some things that are more complicated in C than with some alternatives like MATLAB and Python are setting up the environment. So MATLAB is structured to make it really easy to do matrices, to do sine, usoid, cosine, all those sorts of things. It comes built right in. If you want to do it in something like C, You have to use something like a header, like math.h. And for more complex stuff, you have to use the GLC or GNU Scientific Library. So that's an advantage of going with MATLAB over going with C, because MATLAB is more specifically used for direct things that like engineers would need. C is a more general language that's used on all sorts of things, so it can't be as directly applicable for specifically what our need is. Um, you also have to, in C, specify data types. Whereas in MATLAB, it uh, will assume the data type. Right? And we'll go more into that later. Just meaning when you type in 1.0 in MATLAB, it knows that's the double class type. And uh, if you type it in in C, you have to specify that you want it to be a double. Um, working with matrices, they're built in in MATLAB. For C, it's a much more complicated process. You have some ways of constructing matrices, but to do like matrix multiplication and element by element multiplication, it's complicated. We'll go a little bit into that. But if you really want to use matrices a lot, often C wouldn't be your best choice. What else? Symbolics. Symbolics are a library in MATLAB. It's not in C. There are some potential options. You could create your own, but to do like a symbolic differentiation, that's really simple in MATLAB. It's not so simple in C. So another is complex numbers. That's similar to sign. Uh, you can do it with things like the scientific library and things like numerical integration differentiation. Again, you'll need like the scientific library to do that. And this is open source. You can use it. It's just not built in to the system. So it's not quite as simple. You can't just install C on your computer and have it quite as quickly just pick up everything and be ready with exactly what you want with it. So let's get started into C. First thing is how you actually run C code. With something like MATLAB, you just type in your code in the editor or command window and it will run it once you press the run button. Right? With C, you have to 
write the code, you have to compile the code, and you have to run the executable. So let's go in and we'll start with a Windows environment for creating C code. So I'll swap over here and I'll use MinGW. So I can press the Windows, MinGW. There we go. Um, in different environments, you'll have to go with different approaches to be able to make C programs. But with MinGW, we just file new and then we'll want the Win32 console. So make sure that's clicked. And then we'll do, let's say homework one, click okay. And then this will generate a project. So we can click the plus here, open all the folders. And this is where different files in our project are at. So we won't deal too much with this because we're just going over the foundation, but if you go to source files and you can add source files to project or we can just create a new one. So I'll click C slash C plus plus source file and I'll just call it test or let's say assignment. Okay. Now let's create like the very most basic program and do the compilation and then run it. So to do that most basic thing, we want to create a function. And this is the thing that C will run when it starts. So we'll call it main. And you always want to do this when you have a C program. So you have int space, and that's just creating a function that returns an integer and then main is the name of the function. That's so that C knows to run main. Uh, the parentheses give you that it's a function and tell it what the inputs are. With your main, you can just have it be empty. So you need the parentheses, but just put nothing in there. And then you do open curly braces. This tells you that now you're opening a block and this is where you define the function. And then I can do close curly brace to finish the function. And then for the most basic, I'll return zero. This will just say that I'm going to output a zero when we run this function. And this is a lot for C, just how it how it runs. Um, if you return a zero, return a one, it means different things. So typically you just want to return zero unless you learn more about C and you figure out why you'd want to do something else. So I'll save this and I want to compile. So I'll click this to compile and I'll say compiling. It's got zero errors, one warning. The warning is no new line at the end of file. So to get rid of that, I could do this. It is a warning, so it's not going to stop our code from running. Um, error means it's not going to work. But if I change out so there's not even the new line, then I get zero errors and zero warnings. Perfect. I can then do this, which is build. So now the compiled, it builds it into an executable and click that. And it basically just does some of the linking and stuff and that works. So sometimes depending on the configuration, you have to, when you write the code, you compile it. You then have to do some linking and stuff to get the executable. And then here, this is execute the program. And here it will just pop up we call this console and it just says terminated with return code zero. That's because I returned a zero right here. If I had returned a one, it would say terminated with return code one. Press any key to continue. If I press a key, it will close it. So there, that's the most basic C program. Now let's talk about comments. So to leave a comment on your code, just say something there without having to actually be part of the code, just things for you to read or um, people who are using your code to read. To do a comment, you can do the double slash. And this just makes it so that until you press enter, everything in here is a comment. So this creates a function main that will be 
return an integer. Save that. Now, if we compiled, built, and executed this, it would work perfectly fine. Um, a simpler way to do all this is you can just press the execute. And if you made any changes, it'll say the target file is out of date. Would you like to build it? And you can click yes. And then it will do the whole process. So you can simplify it by just pushing the exclamation mark with a simple file like this. So that's a line comment. A multi-line comment can be done with slash star. And then this is a comment. And then it'll only end when you do star slash. So that's how you can do comments uh, just to put stuff in your code, make notes so that you remember and other people can see how certain things are running, make it a lot faster than actually having to read through and see maybe you got 10,000 lines of code. If you just explain what this one function does, that's the best way of doing it so that somebody doesn't have to reference everything and see how it's working. So that's that. Let's real quick go over some other stuff that really for any program you'll want to include this. So this is sort of the baseline. And the first is a number or hash and include. And then you do a less than sign. And then this is to include a header file. So in C, you, you can make header files that basically have code that allows you to do certain things, either increase what you can actually do on the operating system or just has stuff for C code so that you can run stuff. So I can include a header file. And in this case, I want to do stdio.h. And this is short for standard IO. Um, IO is for input output. So if you want to like put everything, put anything out from this program, a common way of doing it is include stdio.h. And then that includes the function print f. And there it uh, gives you some information because it's a GUI here. It says constant char asterisk format, comma, dot, dot, dot. And all that that's saying is it's looking for a constant character pointer. So we'll go into that a little bit later, but uh, basically just a set of characters that it wants to print. And the way we can do that is with quotation mark and then say, uh, common program to create when you're first learning anything is hello world. So I'll make a basic hello world program right here. So just print F parentheses, then the quotes to define a string here, just a set of characters and close it with the second quote, close parentheses, and then semicolon is needed on almost all lines where in C you define something or you're creating a variable, anything like that. And the semicolon at the end, when you're creating a block like this in int main, you won't need to, when you're including a header file, you won't need to. And C in general, excluding for really the line comment, um, it ignores individual lines. So, and the, the tabs and spaces and everything. So I could have put all this together as a single line and just included the semicolon, uh, took out the tabs. And if I run this, it will show out the hello world and it'll work just fine. The reason why it does this tabbed in and we could do new lines is just for readability for the uh, programmer to be able to see, okay, we're doing a print world and then we're returning zero rather than having to read a bunch of things happening on the same line. So um, this is how you can create a basic program in Windows. We'll look at another way real quick and I'll be working in a Linux, uh, specifically Ubuntu environment and just talking about how you can do it there as well. The code I write will be exactly the same. You could write that in this, you could write it in, you could write this in the Linux environment. Um, it's not about the actual code, it's just how you run it. So I could copy this, put it into a notepad file, save, 
that in this location as assignment2.cpp and it will create it just fine and I'll be able to run it. But if you're new especially, this is often the easiest way of getting into it. So I'd recommend trying this, but I'll be using a different approach and you can use that just fine, of course. So go here. So I've created a basic program. You can see it's called first.c and then I can show you here is how I, if I list my files, I can see first.c, first.cpp, first.out, and I'm working with the first.c. I'll clear and list it. That's my bash function here. You don't need to know the details here. This is just if you wanted to recreate it on a Linux system. And then GCC is the uh, compiler. So I give it my first.c file link, create the output, the executable, first.o, and then I run first.o. First.c is right here. So I'll do int main return zero. Run this again and it does nothing. The problem it was having is I had no int main so it didn't know and see what to do, right? But I'll recreate the same thing I had before it. Re, uh, hashtag include stdio dot h and you can include a space here, not include space, doesn't matter. And then my function print f hello world. And run this. And you can see it is working. It says hello world, but it doesn't, uh, it's kind of confusing in the terminal how it's uh, not entered down here. And we can easily add that in. We can just do slash n, slash n, save that, run it, and now we have a enter after the hello world. So that's the Linux environment. Now let's look at creating variables. The way you create variables is it's dependent on where you want the variable. So if you want it to find in everything, you can do it up here. Int a is 11. This will define an integer with the variable name a with the value of 11. And you don't need this space. It's just for me. Helpful. So I'll say this and try and run it. And it does it just fine. But typically what you want is inside your main function is where you want to define your variables. And then the variables can't be used outside of that. So it limits the scope so that you know, okay, these variables are specifically in the main function. And that's with these uh, curly braces, you know, anything defined in that specifically is not uh, able to be used outside of that. So uh, we showed int, let's look at all of them. Uh, int, float, double, and char are the ones we'll be looking at. Oops, star slash. And int is an integer. So that's one, two, zero, eleven. Just like our int main is a function that returns an integer, we can have variables that are integers. Uh, so just the not decimal point, right? And we can, if we include limits.h, of course, another header file, we can print out the maximum integer and to do an integer, uh, you can have a percent D and percent tells it, okay, I'm expecting to print out a variable from this string. I'll just replace the percent D with some variable. And then I'll use a comma to have a second input to my printf function. That will be what the percent D will be replaced with. So this is the integer that I'm putting in there. So I'll do int max. When I run this, now you can see this is my maximum integer value. So if I want to create an integer, it cannot be bigger than that number. 
Um, you also have float, so I'll just create a variable here. And a is, let's say, 11. You can create a float. B is 12. And floats are floating point numbers and their single precision. So their numbers like 1.1, 1000, 1, 1, 50, uh, so on. Anything that has the decimal point, right? And you can look in a library that's another header, float.h. So the way I can see that is my maximum float is flt max. That's again from the float header file. So if I wanted to display a float here, I can do percent %f oops, and I could do b because b is a variable housing the float. I could just do flt max, but I've got a variable that I'm working with now. So I'll save this, run this. That's the biggest float. So a lot bigger, right? Um, you can also see double. Double C is DBL max. And we'll do an E for double. Some of these don't make a ton of sense, right? Integer is D, uh, load is F. That makes more sense, but double is E. So you just got to get used to it. But let's make a note of those real quick so we can remember. So int, percent D, float, percent F, double, percent E. Save that. And finally, I can have characters, right? We haven't made any characters. We can do that with char. And this is again, any letters, it's the non-numeric stuff, right? So if you wanted to have a and sign, you would have that in character, right? Because it's not a number. So it would work in characters. And to do that, you use C. So character set C. And swatch this to D. Save that and run it. Now I can show an and there. And if I tried, for example, if I had a double that I was trying to put into a C, when I try and run it, I'll get a warning there. C expects int, but it's given a double. So it's probably going to be a little strange there. And indeed, it is. It shows an X instead of a the double max. That It's a little complicated why it's doing that, but basically it converts the double into a character and then prints out that character. So that's how you can create different variables and actually print each of them out. You can create multiple variables by, let's say you wanted um, var one, two, and three to be integers. You can just say int var one, bar two, bar three. And you don't actually have to define them right now. When you initialize them, you can just start it um, and it will create an integer, bar one, bar two, and bar three. And then later you could say bar one is 10, bar two is 11, bar three is 55, whatever you want it to do. But you can initialize these as variables. If you didn't do this, then it would give an error because it doesn't know what these are. Um, I have to define it first. And I can show if I do a integer and do bar one, I can print out 10 here. So perfect. Now let's talk about the names. So when naming variables, so let's see if I tried to create underscore 
R3 here. And I run this, will it work? Well, let's see if we do this, then it will work just fine. So you can include a letter, you can include an underscore at the start of a variable. And then you can, after that, have letters, numbers, a lowercase capital, underscores. You just can't have like symbols. You can't have like an asterisk, things that are used for other things. So you stick with uh, underscore, lowercase capital, letters, and numbers. And C is a case sensitive language. So if I define this underscore capital of R3, it'll give an error because underscore lowercase of R3 is not defined. One thing that you want to make sure when you're doing variables as well is don't try and make like a variable double because double is for the data type. So like you wouldn't want to make a variable called main because you got a function here called main. You wouldn't want to make a variable called int float double char anything like that return. There's lots of things you can't create a variable as. So if you're having difficulty when creating the variable, check if it's because your variable isn't. Trying to be defined with a name that's not allowed. So now let's look at actually doing calculations, right? Because we can define stuff, but let's make it work as a calculator for us to start with. So when I do var1, let's say I want it to be 10 divided by 2. I can do divide, and let's look at our operations. Yeah, plus, minus, asterisk is multiply, and the slash is divide. And those are all of our uh, basic operations. So I can do 10 divided by 2 like this, and, whoops. I referenced var3, which uh, hasn't been given a value yet, so it just defaults to zero. But if I print out var1, save that, it will do five, because that's 10 divided by two, right? A difficulty is var1 is an integer. So if I did 10 divided by two, it's just looking at the full number, the integer five as the output. But if I did 10 divided by three, right what will that return that'll return just three instead of 3.33333 whereas if i wanted to actually see 3.3333 then i would have to do something like a double for var1 and so of course i want to swap this to a double down here and i can say var1 is 10 divided by 3 so now will it work to actually compute 3.333 and it doesn't. Now the reason for this is because it's not the variable that's the problem. As you can see, it does 3.0000 instead of three. But what I what the problem here is the 10 divided by three, it's doing an integer 10 divided by an integer three. And so it returns the same thing as an integer. So to make this actually calculate it as a floating point, I'll need to add the decimal to one or, or both of these, um, doesn't matter if I just include a decimal in the one, then it'll get to the 10.333 or 3.333. So I could also of course, add the decimal to there and it will handle it just fine. But you need the decimal there for it to understand when it's actually computing that it's a floating point. And so to do that calculation as a floating point, and then if this were an integer, it would be able to do the computation. But if I run it, it'll just return three because it, it calculated it as floating point and then sent that to an integer. So it took the floating point and then uh, converted it to that. So you have to be really careful with uh, which data type you're working with. If you want it, to have the decimal point and you're doing something like this, like a fraction, you got to make it a double and include the decimal point so that C 
knows that it's dealing with a floating point. You can see right here that it prints it out. Uh, the integer, of course, it just prints out the number. The double, it prints out as 3.3333e plus zero zero. And that's uh, scientific or engineering notation for uh, times 10 to the zero. So if it were like a billion, it would just be times 10 to whatever number, if it was 10 billion, um, it would just handle it like that. So that's that's what that actually means when it's printing out. If you do percent %f for a float, it will be able to print out the double still. It will just take off that extra notation. So just be aware of that. So that's doing basic operations. There isn't a built-in tool for power like there is in a lot of of uh, languages, but we'll find another way to do that later. So now we'll talk about creating arrays. To create an array, that's a like list of multiple values stored in a single variable. So I can create a variable that's a array of integers by doing int variable and then have brackets open close brackets equals and then do an open curly brace and let's say one two three was the list of integers i wanted for variable i can close with a semicolon save that and now i've created a variable that has a array of values it's got one two and three in the first second and third positions and if i run this it shouldn't give me any errors perfect so definitely recommended with something like c especially where it's got a lot of nuances save it and test running it um, or compiling it a lot because that'll get you through the errors faster and then you can keep going on your code later without having to go backtracking all the time to errors you made a while ago. So um, this is, of course, defining the type, just like a normal variable, then the name, and then the brackets. You can specify in the brackets how big you want it to be. Um, this is just where I'm setting it equal to something immediately. It will just look how big is this thing that I'm setting it equal to and automatically make variable that size. So it will be a size three if I do this. Um, so it's basically the same as doing that. You see that runs just fine, but it's the same as doing the three there. If I tried to do two, it'll give me a warning because I'm trying to fit a three into a two. So there you can see uh, excess elements in array. So the array I tried to fit into it was too big. So what if I did a four? A four it will do just fine. It will just make a, uh, it will just initialize an integer in the next position. So this is basically the same as doing, whoops. Same as doing this, right? So um, if you want to just define a array, you cannot do just this. Variable is one, two, three. So, and actually for this, I've got to do these individually. So I'll make a variable at zero because the way some programming languages work is they start at one in an array or a matrix or whatever they call it. And some start at zero. So if I said variable is one, two, three, then variable at, you can call it up with the brackets, just like I did here. Variable at zero is one. That is what we're saying here, as well as variable at one is two and so on as I've done down below. So that's how we can create an array and modify it. It's a little more complicated than some languages. We also can't like 
delete a variable, we can't just clear uh, variable or var1 or anything. Um, we could limit the scope. So with like a block, if I write this and then run it, it'll run just fine. But now if I tried to say variable at one is 11, it'll give an error because variables undeclared in this scope because it's only defined in this block. So if you wanted like individual uh, workspaces or to have it only to be defined in a limited scope or range or whatever, then you can define it just in this block. You can also do something like this. So the variable isn't defined in this scope, but it's defined above it. And this scope is within this scope. So I couldn't like have one block and then in a separate block call up the same thing. But I can define this and then within that, because this is still within the scope of this int main function, right? Because it's within this first curly brace and before this last curly brace. So these are both within here, but this is more limited in scope because it's within a block within it. So this can access everything in the encompassed block, the block that encompasses this. But past here, once we've closed this scope, this is no longer defined. But we could, for example, let's say we want var2 to equal variable of 2. If we do this, will it work is the question. Because I've set the scope, var2 is defined in here, but then I set it in this limited scope to be equal to 3. So what happens if I run this is the question. And it does actually put it to 3. Because if I say var two is 11, it's still three. But if I commented this out, then it's 11, right? So we are able to revise it. It's just that if it's only defined, so if I called up variable of one, so this should be two, and I'll just make integer here, I get two because the variable is defined within the whole scope and then I revised it in the limited scope because it, but because it was defined in the full scope it's able to be seen in the full scope even the revised thing so it doesn't like create a limited it, it doesn't use this variable and create a variable just within this scope when we edit it it is changing the variable with this scope so hopefully that makes that a little bit clearer. But that's how you could break it up and have like multiple workspaces or anything like that. Now, of course, you want to remember the array starts at zero. But another thing with arrays, and let's just delete this, we can create higher dimensional arrays. So this array is just a list, right? If I look at this, when we're talking about arrays like this, we're just talking about like one, two, three, four, five, six, so on, whatever you want, but it's just a list. Um, with something like a matrix, you have multiple dimensions. So maybe you want one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Well, the way we can actually recreate this matrix is by doing a array of arrays. So we just have this be one array, this be another array, and this be another array, and put those all into arrays. So if we add A is one, two, three, B is four, five, six, 
and C is 7, 8, 9. Then we could say this matrix is an array with A, B, and C in it. So that is how we can create higher dimensions. And we could then fit in, if A were a matrix, we could fit in 3D. So have these be like layered on top of each other. So this is the 2D matrix. This is the 2D matrix. And this is the 2D matrix. If this was A, like some matrix like this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, with some rows and columns, and B was another matrix, and C was another matrix, then we could fit that in as arrays. This is an array of, an, of arrays. This is an array of arrays, and this is an array of arrays. So this would be an array of arrays of arrays, basically. So you can just keep going with that process. But to do this in C, we can go ahead and create and I can skip the step of actually creating the A, B, and C that we were talking about. So I can just do open the array and then the first array in here, one, two, three, and then comma second array, comma the third array. And instead of just being able to say four here, I need to specify the number of arrays, housing arrays, and the number of elements in that array. So in this case, it's three and three, but this is basically how many we're fitting into, how many arrays we're fitting in here, and this is how many are in each array. So this can be thought of, we go back, the number of rows. So we got one, two, three rows, and one, two, three columns. The number of rows is first, and the number of columns is second. And so if we run this, it'll give us an error because we are calling up a array with a variable of one. So we want to call up just a single integer. So we'll look at, let's say we want from the matrix, let's say we want six. So that'll be row two, column three. Then I can say row two, but because we start at zero, it's actually one because the first column is zero. So you subtract one from the row and the column. I get my six because it's row two, column three. So there we go. That's how we can create arrays of arrays or more complex things like matrices. And if we wanted to for example, make a variable that's the same as variable, but multiplied by 11. Can we just like multiply an array by 11, I guess is the question. So variable times 11 and save that, run that. And we get an error because it says invalid operands to binary the star, the multiplication. Um, we have an int star of three with an int. So that's not valid. Could we do variable times variable? No. So that's not valid either. So when you're trying to like add or multiply matrices or these arrays, even just a single array, Let's just try and add 10 to it. So of course I need to swap this. But you can see it won't work if I change that. It still gives an error because variable is an array. And so trying to add 10 to it won't work. It would just be like for adding two integers together, not an array and an integer. So that makes C a lot more difficult when doing things like adding a scalar to a matrix, just a single value, of course, for the scalar and an array for the matrix. Um, so doing things like linear algebra 
uh, math with matrices and vectors and arrays like this, you have to use different approaches than you can in a language like MATLAB or uh, Python, you can do it as well, where you're able to directly add an integer to an array, for example. But that's how we can create those arrays. And we could, of course, we just have to manually create the variable and we could say variable two of zero is variable of zero plus 10. And then we could do this for the first and second position. And now if I run it, it won't give me an error. And if I were to look at variable two of one, I should get variable of one and that would be two. And then the variable two is that plus 10. So now I successfully get 12. So we can add it. We just have to manually go through. And obviously this takes a lot more time than if we could just say equals variable plus 10. So that's the matrices. Next, uh, we'll look at strings or sets of characters. So I'll create new variable string one, and this will be character, but I want it to have multiple characters. And the way I can do this is with an array of characters and just as with the printf, I can do hello world. And now I basically have an array with a bunch of characters. And if I wanted to print that out, I could have string one here and percent s for a string or a set of characters. And I'll just have that there and there we go i took out the hello world but that's in that's in this string one so i could change this I could change this to friend and now it'll say hello friend so it's just printing out exactly what's in this string so that's pretty cool we could of course also go through and make an array here with all these characters. I'll do that now just to illustrate. So now I've got a array of these characters and it will work exactly like before. Okay. And this, Oops. I need to close that array. And now when I run it, it is the exact same thing. And if I took out that exclamation point, it will of course take out the exclamation point. So obviously just typing out, hello friend is a lot faster. So that's why you would do with the quotes instead of the array with each of the characters individually there. Um, you could also of course, just make this like 100 and that will work just fine. But I could then string one of 15. I could then put in there, say, B. This won't show up the 15th element because it doesn't have every element filled in before that point. And First, let's try one, which is the second position, which you can see we can add it perfectly well. And 11 is the last one. So if I do 12, we'll add it to the end. But if I try to do 13, it won't work. But if I did 12, and then 13, it will work. So you wouldn't be able to, when printing a character array with percent %s, 
You can't add in a later character when you've missed some in your defining it and still have that later character be printed out. And if we tried the same thing with a numeric matrix, so let's say double A of 100 is, let's say, 1, 2, 3. And then we try and say A of 5 is 11. We wouldn't have the same problem because I put E here and A of 5. And this double A 100 conflicting types for A. Well, it's because A I already made, so A, B, C will be my variable instead. There we go. And you can see it's 1.1 times 10, which is, of course, 11. Um, if I swap this to F, it'll be 11.000. If I swap this to D, it will convert that double to an integer, which leads to an unexpected result, as you can see. We get a really weird number there on the bottom, and we get a warning just notifying us of the conversion from double to integer in the printf. So yeah, we can do that, and we don't have the same problem, but because of the way percent %s works, if we try and define the 13th position in the string of characters, but we don't actually have a 12th, so it won't print out the 13th. And the way you could actually check, right, if it's successfully creating or putting into string one at position 13b uh, would be if you put in 12 afterwards, does that then print out the string correctly? And it does. So it's just because of the way percent %s works that it's doing that. Of course, if we did percent %c, then we'd have to do percent %c, percent %c, and then string of zero, string one of one, string one of two, and so on. So if we did just this, it would be H-E-L. The last thing we'll go into is doing more math stuffs. And the way we can do that is with another header and math.h now. And with math.h, we can do something like power. So if we wanted one to the power of three, then I can create a variable and let's just say this is answer one. So that this equal to, and then we can use the function pow from math.h and one to the power of three. And here I'll print a double and answer. One is what I'm printing. And of course, one to the power of three is one. If I did three to the power of two, I'll get nine, right? And let's do answer two, where we do sine of pi over two. And let's do another printf. So we first printed out answer one, then we did new line. So then I want to print out, let's say sine of, and then we'll do the pi over two is, and then we'll do the sine of pi over two. So here, the first thing I want to feed in is pi, and I'll create a variable for that. And then the second I want to feed in is answer two. And Great pi double pi is 3.145. We'll just call it that for now. And answer two is sine of pi. And if I run this, let's see, we got an error. I, of course, forgot semicolon. But now we've got, we didn't actually. 
Oh, we printed it out. We just didn't do a new line at the end. So let's add that. And then we can run this again. So sine of 3.1415 is 0 0.00093. And the reason it didn't get a perfect zero is because it's calculating out what the sign of that very specific value is. And it doesn't quite understand in its calculations that it should be exactly zero. Uh, besides 3.1415 is not exactly pi. But if we wanted pi over two, then we can do sine pi over two, and then just put over two in here, for example. Or I could, of course, do pi over two right here. That would work perfectly fine. Just depending on which way you want it to look like, right? And that'll be one when there's zero, zero, zero. So that way we can we can do multiple printfs. I could of course have just continued writing the printf sign of percent f, so on, and then just add comma pi over two comma answer two. But I separated it out, so it's a little bit easier for me to read. We can do tangent cosine. Tangent is tan, cosine is cos. Uh, we can do inverse tangent, which is a tan, inverse cosine, which is a cos, inverse sine, which is a sine, natural log and log base 10. There's so much stuff to a language like C, so you're going to be using Google and Stack Overflow and lots of tools to just search up and like, if you can't remember how to do sign, then look it up and, and that's how everyone's gonna, gonna be doing it. For the basic stuff, you'll eventually need to remember so you don't have to look it up every time you need. If you can't remember what the symbol for multiply is, then be in a bit of trouble. But if you can't remember some nuanced thing, your boss would be mad at you for not just looking up the answer uh, in a second with the internet. It's a great tool. So that's that, and that's all we'll go over for now. Hope you learned a lot. Thanks.